I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessed assurance that you give us. And we thank you for that constant grace that you supply us. And we pray as we gather around this word today and reflect on the truth that it provides us, that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers of all of us here are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's an outline in your bulletin on the yellow insert. If you'd like to follow along with the words that I'm sharing today, you certainly are free to do that. Our scripture today, we're going to come to that in a moment. It's from the letter to the Philippians. And before we do that, though, I want to put it into a little bit of context, historical context and otherwise. But the letter to the Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was writing this letter toward, toward the end of his career. Not at the very end. Getting close. Golf analogy, not putting on the 18th green, but made the turn and the clubhouse is there. Right? It's in view. It's kind of nearing second half of his career for sure. And by this point in his life, he's already logged thousands of miles. He's been serving the ministry, his ministry, for over a decade. He's been traveling throughout the Mediterranean region, spreading Christianity and planting churches. Thousands and thousands of miles. In fact, the church in Philippi, in that letter to the Philippians, is is, is written to the Philippians, the people of Philippi. That's the name of the city. The city, in the church in Philippi, is 700 miles away from his home base. That's not that bad today. The last 48 hours, we've logged over 800 miles in the car. Tolerable, right? Not desirable, but doable. But at, at that time, 700 miles... And he'd done that over and over again, making circular trip after circular trip around this area, on the water, on land. He's tired, tiring out. Also, he had, by this point, established many churches in many cities. And he didn't have always a real strong relationship with every one of them. It was, it, he, he cared about them, but they weren't always that positive. For example, he was in the area of modern-day Turkey. At the time, it was called Galatia, and he established a couple churches there in some different cities in that territory. And he thought that he had communicated things to them clearly. Right? He thought that he had explained to them what it meant to be a Christian, that we are saved by grace, which is a gift of faith, uh, and it's not the product of our own good works. He thought he explained that. He thought that they got it. He thought that he explained to them what it meant to live as a Christian and how to worship. And then as soon as he leaves, he gets word that the people were doing the very thing he told them not to do. So he writes them a letter. And if you, when we look at the letter to the Galatians, right at the very beginning, he's starting to give them a greeting. Hello, Paul, writing this letter to you. And he can't even get done with the grading. He's so frustrated. He launches into, I cannot believe, I am astonished that you are so quickly turning away from the gospel that I taught you in another direction. So he's clearly frustrated. All that's to say that none of that existed with the Christians in Philippi. None of that existed with them. He loved them. And they loved him. It was a great relationship. Mutual affection. You see, years earlier, when Paul started the church there, when he first arrived in town, he was homeless, had nowhere to go. He and his traveling companions, they didn't have uh, roots there in Philippi. And a woman named Lydia opened her household and welcomed him in. She was a successful businesswoman at the time, had a big family. She was a benefactor for Paul's ministry. And she even brought her whole family to be baptized. Paul never forgot that, never forgot that hospitality that he had received. 
And one of the guys that, that Paul was traveling with when he planted the church there was a man named Epaphroditus. Go ahead. Right? Rolls right off the tongue. Right? It's like Bill or John today, I'm sure. Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was with Paul. They planted the church there. They leave. And Epaphroditus gets ill, deathly ill. But the, the people in Philippi, they sent what we would call care packages, prayers, messages, letters, gifts of all kinds. And Paul never forgot that generosity. Epaphroditus made a, a dramatic recovery. And so Paul said, go back to Philippi. This is the kind of relationship he had. Go back to Philippi and celebrate with them. They want to see you healthy again. And, and you can also communicate thanksgiving to them. It'll be good to do. That's, see, that's the kind of relationship they had. No animosity, no antagonism, just love, great affection. So Paul sent Epaphroditus back to Philippi, but he himself could not go. Couldn't go. Not that he didn't want to go, but he was in prison, literally confined. Why? We're not exactly sure on this imprisonment. Throughout his life, he had been in prison more than once. Sometimes preaching the gospel upset the religious leaders, and the religious establishment had him in, thrown in jail. Another time, he preached out in the name of justice. He saw some people getting taken advantage of economically. He came to their defense and called the people who were manipulating them and abusing them to account? Well, they didn't like that, so they had him thrown in jail. It seemed like wherever Paul was going, he was upsetting somebody. He even had death threats on his life. He was also beaten on a couple of occasions so badly that people didn't think he would survive. All of that's to say, here's Paul, the second half of his life, the downside of his career, his body's tired, right? he's hurting, he's logged all these miles, he's done all this work, and now he's in prison, he's got nothing to do but think. Think about his life, where he's been, what might lie ahead. And it's at that time that he sits down, picks up the proverbial pen and paper, and he writes the letter to the Philippians. It's a great letter. It's only four chapters long. The end of that letter has some of the great, greatest words we, we draw upon when we're struggling. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. But right here, we're at the beginning of the letter. And Paul writes these words to his friends in Philippi. I'm going to recite our scripture today, Philippians 1, 21 to 26. And here's what Paul says. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am tossed between the two. My request... Is, is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. And yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and for your joy and faith, so that... I may share abundantly, abundantly with you in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I am able to come to you again. The word of God for the people of God. Paul, in that little snippet, begins by saying some very, very memorable words. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here's what I believe he means by this. To live our lives 
on earth is to live for Christ, is to live for him, is to live in such a way that our faith is reflected in what we say and do. That's what Paul means when he says fruitful labor, to live is Christ. If I live in the flesh, that's fruitful labor for me. Jesus is the, the vine, the branch. We are the fruit that's born from the branch. The way that we're fruit and bear fruit is by reflecting Christ in us, in what we say and do. Right? To live on earth is to live for Christ, not merely for ourselves, for Christ. So that Christ is seen through us in what we say and do. And yet he also says to die is gain, meaning his own personal gain. Right? As we said last week, as long as we live on earth, we are not yet connected eternally in our permanent spiritual home. That can only happen when we leave the body, right? When our days here on earth are done, when we say goodbye to earth. Then we'll have this personal eternal connection in heaven. Great for us, right? That's a blessing. And Paul is torn between these two places. Second half of his career, body breaking down, tired from all the work that he's done. Right? He's tempted by retirement. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it would be easy to, to pack it in, take an early retirement. I've done a lot of work. No one can, can blame me for not having done enough. Right? Plus, I would have the added benefit of not being thrown in jail every once in a while. Right? It'd be nice to just sit back and kick my feet up and dream about my reunion with Christ whenever that day comes. But then, but then he also loves the people. <laughs> he loves the church. He loves them. He cares about them. He remembers their kindness, their generosity. He thinks about their progress, their continued faith. So he's torn. But he finally makes a decision. He's not going to take an early retirement. He's going to invest in this time that he has to continue to do the work of Christ. And by the way, as a quick aside, I, just, I, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not blaming you if you're retired. Right? Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to retire. And if you are retired, I'm not suggesting that you have to go back to work. If you feel guilty about retirement, that's you, not me. Okay. Because really, it's the inspiration for Paul that's important. Not, not as much as decision. Because he says... He says, I'm not, I'm not yet, the role is not yet called up yonder for me. Christ hasn't called me home yet. So as long as I'm here in the flesh, my calling is to live for others and for your progress. And that's, for Paul, faith is deeply personal, but it's not purely individual. He would say, my faith is not given for me alone and just for my eternal reunion with Christ in the kingdom of heaven. My faith is given to me so that others may be served, so that Christ is served in my service to others, in my sharing of love, in my sharing of mercy. I, in so doing, I'm a witness to the faith that I profess. And God is praised and proclaimed in my actions. To live is to live for Christ. That's what he meant I believe when he said, to live is Christ and to die is also gain. But the beautiful thing about those words that Paul wrote from his own personal experience is that he had no idea that they would impact a young girl born 1,800 years later. Her name was Fanny Crosby. She was born just north of New York City in the year 1820. And when she was just six weeks old, she got sick probably a, a virus, a cold, but medicine being what it was in 1820 vis-a-vis -vis 2018, her eyes were swollen, took on great inflammation, and ultimately led to her blindness. She would live to, she was 94, and from six weeks old until she died at age 94, she was blind. When she was six months old, her father died, leaving her to be raised by two strong women, her mother and her grandmother. They were regulars at church, and they instilled in her a great faith. 
when she was 10 years old. Backtrack. Some of you know that I've memorized the Gospel of Mark. You know that? I've memorized the Gospel. I can't do it right now. I need a couple days to, to refresh. But, but it's back there, right? The Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters. I, I did that. I can recite it in 90 minutes. Right. Fanny Crosby, at the age of 10, under the tutelage of her grandmother and, and mother, began memorizing five chapters of Scripture a week. And when she was 15 years old, she could recite from memory Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all 31 chapters of the Proverbs. What have we been doing? <laughs> the Bible in a year. <laughs> That's what we've got. This is Fanny Crosby. When she was 15, she entered the New York Institute for the Blind, and she began to play the piano, the harp, the organ, the guitar, and she became an accomplished singer. As she grew into adulthood, she became a regular at a Baptist church in Brooklyn. And she began writing poetry and lyrics. She was a musician, but she didn't as much compose music as she wrote lyrics for other melodies. And she would go on to be called the queen of gospel music, the queen songwriter of gospel and Christian music. She wrote over 8,000 hymns in Christian songs. Her music has been reprinted over 100 million times the world over, right, to, to date. And she was so prolific and so popular that she had to write music under pseudonyms. You know why? The hymnal companies didn't want to have too many songs from one person in a, in, in a book. She's written things like, I am thine, O Lord, to God be the glory. Jesus, keep me near the cross. That's Fanny Crosby. And in 1873, when she was 53 years old, she was invited by a friend named Phoebe Knapp to come to Phoebe's house. Phoebe was also a musician, played a little mel melody on the piano, and asked Fanny, what do you think of when you hear these words? And without hesitating, Fanny Crosby said, oh. Really? Without hesitating, she said, Jesus is mine. And so, so gave, gave us a song. Guys, you want to come up? We have another version of Blessed Assurance we want to do here today. Um, we'll call the guys up. But today is week three of our sermon series on favorite hymns and songs. We asked you, the congregation, to share with us your favorite hymns and songs. We would preach on one a, a week in the month of July. So far we have had uh, How Great Thou Art, then we had last week I'll Fly Away, and today Fanny Crosby's Blessed Assurance. This is a version that came to me uh, from my uh, father-in-law. We on there? There we go. There we go. Uh, you can sing along if you want. You know the words, uh, but this is a different version. It came by way uh, of a trip to Africa. Heaven above, echoes of mercy, 
this bit of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Do, do, do. Submission, all is in rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. So, blessed assurance, right? Fanny Crosby's words, but the beautiful thing about Fanny Crosby is that she didn't just write lyrics to all of these songs. Did you know that Fanny Crosby was the first woman to speak before Congress? And she spoke before Congress to urge the legislature to spend more money on the education for the blind in the United States. She spent her whole life in New York City. We would call the work that she did social work or social services. At the time in the 19th century, it was called rescue mission work, city missions work. She opened shelters. She started orphanages. She opened food stations. We'd call them soup kitchens today. She spent decades advocating city government on behalf of the urban poor. Her biographer said that, that whenever she received an honorarium, some money for work that she had done, she was likely to give it away to someone less fortunate. When she was 83 years old, she was still going strong, and she was interviewed by somebody who said, what do you consider an, your greatest accomplishment? And she didn't mention music. She said, my calling in life is to do missions among the poor in New York City. And later she would say that in fact the inspiration that she received to write the beautiful words that she did came from her work serving others. Fanny Crosby also said that of all the verses in Scripture that she might have memorized, and Lord knows there was a bunch, the verse that we heard today from Philippians 1.21 was one of her favorites. To live is Christ. And so when she writes, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, we see in her life story, the scripture revealed, as long as you're here in the flesh, in the body, the call is to serve others, and in so doing, we are serving the Christ we worship. Faith for Fanny Crosby, as it was for Paul, the call to all of us, it's supposed to be deeply personal, but it's never meant to be purely individual. Fanny Crosby reminds us of that. The music reminds us of that. Paul reminds us of that. May we take these stories with us. May we live not for ourselves, but for others, bearing fruit on Christ's behalf, serving him by serving those around us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being our blessed assurance, and may we live our lives in such a way that we reveal that blessed assurance to others. In your holy name we pray. Amen.